Welcome to Pyramid Times. Myself, Meena Sulbu, Creative Director at Pyramid Times. And we have wonderful guest with us, Betty Steinhauer. Betty Steinhauer considers herself as a citizen of the world. Even as a young mother, Betty was active in the community, sitting on a number of boards and lending her expertise to various public organizations. In 1983, she founded a consulting firm where for 25 years, she used her unique abilities to act as a catalyst, facilitator, and advisor to both the private and public sectors. After being hit by a car, not long after retiring, she had an epiphany and realized that she had been on her own spiritual journey since her first visit to India in 1990. She has traveled 155 countries and made friends all over the world, but she still had unanswered questions. So she decided to still sell everything, pack up her life and travel the world, learning about various cultures, communities and people. Her documentation of what she learned as she interviewed people from around the world and from all walks of life is the basis of her own book, In Search of Spiritual Intelligence. And there is also a web website of her, the nomadicintern.com. With this, I welcome uh, Betty to the show. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Lovely to be here. And also we have another guest with us, Dr. V. Harikumar. He's a hair transplant surgeon and anti-aging coach. He extensively trains people in spirituality and he's uh, there on 70 plus uh, TV channels in all over India and he tra travels across the world. Yes. With this, uh, uh, today's topic is on to be uh, the book interview on In Search of Spiritual Intelligence. Yes, sir. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. Betty... Stay in her. Ji, Namaskar. Namaste. Uh, very glad to see you in this uh, Pyramid Times platform. We are all here to know more about you because you are extensive global traveler with the spiritual intelligence and you represent mm. a blog entitled Nomadic Intern. What exactly it is and uh, what is all about your background? We uh, well, I think Vina covered my background quite well. I think there was only one piece uh, that maybe she, a few pieces. I have two children and I have four grandchildren in Canada. I was born in the UK and moved to Canada when I was four years old. Um, brought up my family. I did have a consulting company for 25 years and the who's who of the corporate world and politics were my clients. So it was wonderful. I got to meet and do a number of really great things. I then formed a charity on my second visit to India. I ended up in the hospital with uh, pneumonia in Northern India in Mount Abu. And then that's where I discovered that for a very little bit of money, you could really help people. So I came back to Canada and formed a charity and called it the People Bridge Charitable Foundation. And for 11 years, I raised money in Canada and ran around the world donating and setting up projects and that really taught me about the developing world and what was going on i felt very very fortunate and very blessed in terms of the people i met and how people were really trying to help themselves and i'm a great believer in motivating people give them a start but don't give everything to them because i think people feel much better about themselves so that was the second part of my life and then I was asked to write my memoir, which was published in India, I think about eight years ago, called My Way, which is the story of my life, the good and the bad and the indifferent. And then um, I set up this blog called The Nomadic Intern. And I basically one day I just decided I wanted to travel. So I wanted to get rid of everything. So I sold everything, gave it away. I lived in a lovely apartment right in the center of Toronto. I had everything you could possibly want in the world, but I decided I wanted to travel, meet people, see how other people lived in the world. And I love the potential of um, the unknown. I love the potential of meeting people that are doing really phenomenal things and continue on my own spiritual path. So the nomadic intern is really about my travels and I try to write a blog every two to three weeks. And it's about the good and the bad and the people I've met and the wonderful opportunities I've had along the way. 
And that's how this new book was developed too. So that's the story of my nomadic internship. The name was given to me by a woman in New York who said, okay, you're gonna start this traveling and you really don't have an address. Uh, so I call myself homeless by choice and um, just go on your travels and we're gonna, be, we're gonna give you the name of the nomadic intern. So that was how all that started. Wow, wow, wonderful. So people usually focus focuses on their health, their family, their work, but ah. in the final <laughs> people always want to travel different, different places and want a different, different people, different, different cultures. You are already in that. You traveled very extensively and you met very wonderful people. So right. we want to know more about your travels and meeting many, many wonderful people and what are all the things you learned, you experienced. And we mm. want to hear those experiences of traveling, ma'am. Okay. Well, I think that, you know, I've been very fortunate because I am a friend of the Brahma Kumari Spiritual University in India. So I've spent, I think I've been to Mount Abu 23 times over the last 30 years. Oh. So I've had the opportunity of seeing a number of groups and meeting a number of people right around the world. So I have been extremely fortunate. And my travels have gone in various different directions. I mean, if you ask me about the two most powerful trips in my life, it would deal, they would both deal with animals, okay? I had the opportunity in Mauritius to walk with two lions. Oh, and wow. I walked with two lions and a trainer for an hour in the jungle. And I realized very quickly why they're called the king of the jungle. It was the most powering and humbling experience. It was just phenomenal to walk with these two great big lions and they were tall and I was very short compared to those lions. That was phenomenal. And the other experience I had to do with animals was I always had a dream to go to visit the silverback gorillas in Veranda. And I went to Veranda and it was during a very tough time. I was in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was very tough politically. It was very unsafe. And I was the only one that wanted to go to see these apes. So I had, I had um, two guards. I had two cars in front of me full of security guards. I had a trainer and I had a bodyguard. And we had to trek for six hours to actually get to the spot where the apes were. Now, I'm 77 years old, so that was a real hike. And I, it took me, it was a long, long, hot hike. But when I got there, we finally found the clearing in the jungle and the silverback gorillas, they move every day. So you never quite know where they're going to be. And so I, we were very fortunate. We found a family of 26 and I got to spend two and a half hours with these 26 gorillas. And they learned, I learned so much just about them and why they're so close to us. It's quite amazing. They're not in our zoos because they have no immune system. So you have to wear a mask when you go to see these gorillas and you have to be totally covered up because they can catch anything very, very quickly. So that again was very humbling, taught me about humanity in a big way. And, and I spent two and a half hours of the most phenomenal time in my life. And I cried when I left them, I cried because the father, the mothers were all there and they were looking after their children. Their children were playing in the trees. They didn't care about me. I was just sitting there on the ground. They could care less, but it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. One that I will never ever forget. And uh, I learned so much about me in terms of just being quiet and being watchful and noticing little things like the mother is taking the flies out of the, the children's hair and making sure that their, their hair, she was combing her hair, their hair with their fingers. They were so much like humans, it was unbelievable. But the other, the worst part of the whole trip was I had to trek back six hours and it was a long, long, long trek. And we had to get back before um, dusk because there was curfews and it was very, very dangerous at night. So I remember getting back to this little hotel where I had stayed the night before. I was literally covered in mud and covered in dust and climbed in and just basically fell asleep. But it was uh, one of the best experiences of my life. 
So I met a lot of people on my travels, but those two things stand out just because of the, they were highly unusual and they were so spiritual in a very different way. Wonderful, Betty Ji. And when Veena and me were here in Hyderabad, we too had contact with all the Brahma Kumaris here. Ah, wonderful, wonderful, yes. Wonderful meditation. And uh, yes. you had very wonderful experiences when you traveled to different, different places. Uh, we yeah, really yeah. love it. And you explained in such a way that we too had a wonderful trip to all those places. Okay. Well, no. Daddy Jenki, Daddy Jenki, who passed away this year, she was the head of the Brahma Kumaris, and she was basically my mentor. And I met her for the very first time 30 years ago. And as you know, she spoke Hindi, no English. I spoke no Hindi. But we had this wonderful relationship. It was just there. Whenever we saw one another, it was totally out of love and gratitude, and we would hug and whatever. But she was basically my spiritual teacher. And um, she taught me a lot. She was tough, but she was lovely. And she was honest. And she is, um, I think, the best spiritual teacher I've ever met. Many people know about emotional intelligence, but you have written a wonderful book called Spiritual Intelligence. Ah. We want to know the source, how, how it uh, has come into your mind and how it has come into the people so that it transformed well, many people. What, hap what happened was I was in Athens two years ago and I was at the Brahma Kumari Center and I was going to visit one of the teachers there. Her name is Gopi from London. And she said to me, you know, you're getting older. She said, you need a new project. She said, you haven't had a project in a while because I always like to be busy and whatever. And I said, no, I don't need a new project. She said, oh yes, you do. So we talked and we talked for about six hours, matter of fact, over tea, which led into dinner. And then we talked about the difference between emotional intelligence, IQ, emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. And, you know, I said to her, I've met so many phenomenal people from all walks of life all over the world and all social economic incomes and whatever that, it would be very interesting to talk about their own spiritual path and what they see the difference is between emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. And that's how it started. And then I kind of left that meeting and said, okay, fine, I'm gonna make a short list of people I want to interview, which I did very quickly and they all agreed. <laughs> so it was, I was on my path. So I was interviewing. I didn't go and interview them personally. I interviewed them by phone, taped them all and then transcribed them from there. So it was a two year, it took me a year to accomplish all the interviews. We interviewed about 40 people all around the world. And then um, it took me another year to do the transcribing and writing the book. And I play the narrator in the book and the book is full of these people's stories and basically, I asked them three questions. I asked them what their definition of spiritual intelligence was. I asked them what they felt about spiritual intelligence now in this world of chaos. And the third question was, tell me a little, about, a little bit about your own road to being spiritually intelligent or where you, how you got to where you are now. Those were the three questions I asked each of my people. Veena, you being the workshop leader, of access bars and uh, you heal your life and many workshops you do and uh, speak on uh, uh, you are you are enlightening the public the participants on uh, emotional uh, spiritual questions so what's your opinion and uh, what are all your questions to betty yeah so going through the book uh, betty you have emphasized on the importance of god and connection to god can you explain more on that Ah, okay. Well, I have to go back to give you a little bit about my background in terms of my connection with God. Um, I did not like God at all until about six years ago. I lost a child when I was very young and the child died at a year and a very serious heart defects. And I always blame God for that. I never understood how God could ever let a, long, a young child die. So it's taken me a long time to get to that place in my life where I can even say the word God. And it took about six years ago when I finally could say the word God without choking. 
So it's taken a long time to reach that position where I believe that I'm protected and I know I'm protected because of traveling I've done and I've gone through so horrendous times. I've been shot at, I've been whatever. So I've been very, very fortunate to be where I am now. And, uh, but I now recognize there is a God and I have, I feel that I have such blessing and such gratitude for God and such love for God. So yes, now I understand, but it took me a long time. Yeah, also you have mentioned about the personal ego and uh, and living in the family constructs and coming breaking those constructs to live an adventurous lifestyle. My family? Okay, well, my life is highly unusual. Um, I've been divorced for a lot of years and my two children are in their 50s now, so they're older. And they basically have a number of questions about how I live my life. I wouldn't say that they're comfortable with it at all, okay? My grandchildren, I have four grandchildren, they think I'm the coolest grandmother out. But my children, um, they find it a highly unusual life. And so do my friends. I mean, it's, it's um, I spend a lot of time keeping in touch with people, whether it be in the UK, whether it be in Canada, whether it be wherever I am, because I have a highly unconstructed life. I mean, I manage my life in my own strange way, but it's not anything that anyone can really relate to. So I think it causes people some questions, but I basically am very happy and I don't question this life. I have no idea how long it will go on for. I'm very careful. I have medical insurance. I, have, I do all the right things for myself, but I know it's a highly unusual life and I know many people question why I'm doing it. But for me, if I was living in the UK or living in Canada and what is called a normal life, I would be very bored and it would not be very good. <laughs> yeah. How did you choose the people you interviewed? I chose, I chose, I chose half of half of the people were Brahma Kamaris that I had met around the world. And I chose them on purpose in terms of the people that I felt that I had run into from the BK community that were very real and very true to who they were and had been on their own path for a lot of years. And then the other 15 people were people that I had met and from all walks of life, whether it be the head of the Church of Scotland or a little lady in Veranda who was just so special and so lovely. I mean, it, Everybody was was different and I chose them because I felt that they had something to offer to the world and they were very humble and very quiet about it and really didn't understand what they were doing in the world and what they were doing was good in the world. For example, the lady in Veranda, she was a BK and she ran this little BK center in the middle of Kigali and she lived right beside the Genocide Museum. And as you well know, the genocide in Veranda was very, very serious. And the museum just brought me to tears, but she lived in this little center. And she said to me, you stay here. I said, oh no, no, I'll go to a guest house or a hotel. She said, no, I want you to stay here. So I stayed there. And then she said to me, but I have something to tell you. I said, what? She said, I don't have any hot water. My hot water tag's broken. Now, I love to have a hot shower every morning, okay? So I said, okay, that's fine. I'll be fine. But she was so humble. She got up in the middle of the night and she boiled water for me, pots and pots of water. And I woke up in the morning and there was all this water. She was so lovely. And then she took me to parliament the next day, the parliament and veranda. And as soon as we walked in the door and she was a little tiny woman, everyone stood up and they weren't standing up for me. They were standing up in respect for her. But she was so humble and so quiet and she loved God so much, but she had no idea of her own strength and her own energy in the community. So those are the type of people that I look for when I, when I was interviewing for this book. Me and Veena, along with all the viewers, wants to know more about uh, your book. How would you describe your book? Veena, what do you say? Anything you want to ask very particular about the spiritual intelligence book? What yes. is the message that viewers can take away after reading the book? Um, my message is I'm not trying, there is not, it's not an intellectual book at all. It's a book of stories and every chapter has a method, has a, has a message of some type, whether it be forgiveness, whether it be gratitude, 
whether it's just being how to learn to be in this world. The messages are very subtle and I want it to be something that anyone could pick up and pick up the book and look at any chapter and get something out of it. They didn't necessarily have to read the whole book, but it's, you know, it'd be interesting to read the beginning in terms of my own life and how i am got to this point. But it was more important to me that people pick up the book and they could pick up any chapter and they could say, hey, this is, this is something I want to know about. And there's about, uh, I'm trying to see, there's about 20, 25, 30 chapters. And so there's a whole range of chapters from A to, you know, from A to Z in terms of what people want to know. And some of the chapters are things that I've lived through myself. For example, one being facing the terrorists, murderers, and rapists among us is something that I dealt with in Toronto when someone, uh, uh, there was the terrorist attack and they, they gunned down a, um, a colleague of mine. And um, I was asked by the press how I felt about all of this. And I said, you know, this person just has to be forgiveness, has to be forgiven. And the press got very mad at me because I wouldn't get angry. So, you know, there's many, many types of stories like that in the book. That's so wonderful, amazing. Wonderful. And, yeah. Strong follower of Brahma Kumaris and a nomadic intern and an author of best selling book, Spiritual Intelligence Author. We want to hear and do a simple meditation, simple a guided okay. meditation from you so that we can imbibe, we can imbibe the essence of you and we can dip into that spiritual intelligence so that our soul will, will be awakened and uh, will have the integrity, harmony of external and internal environment. And uh, what do you say, Veena? It's a, it's a very wonderful thing to hear from her about a simple guided meditation so that you can take all of us into the external journey and meeting the people, having many, many experiences you did. So we want to grab, we want to absorb, absorb your essence through a guided meditation. What would you say? Okay. I'm not too sure I can give you a guided meditation. Um, I would yes. think one of the best things to do is give you a little bit of a reading of the book. Um, yeah, we'll sit in meditation with closed eyes, guide all of our uh, viewers, so that we'll listen to her message in meditation. All the intelligence, spiritual intelligence from her book. Let us feel the energy, the consciousness of the book, spiritual intelligence. Sit in a comfortable posture with closed eyes. Okay. Clasp the fingers fly, and listen to <laughs> Betty Steinhardt. Okay, what I'm going to read is something called What If Spirituality Doesn't Appeal to You? It's one of the very last chapters of the book. And the person that's interviewed in here, his name is Will Stora, and he was head of the Church of Scotland. He also runs the um, Theology Institute out of Princeton University. And he's a very good friend of mine. And this is a very simple chapter, but I think the description in it really hits home to me about how to be um, a person that is full of gratitude and feels they have a lot of blessings in this world. So, yes. be with the breath and listen to the Betishi. Be with, be with the breath okay. and listen to the energy, the wisdom of Betty. Okay, thank you. So the chapter is, what if spirituality doesn't appeal to you? It is somewhat ironic that all of the definitions and explanations of spiritual intelligence I heard while researching this book, the one person who said, I don't have a spiritual view of spirituality was a man of God. I'm talking of none other than Will, who I introduced before is a minister with the Church of Scotland and director of the Center of Theology Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey, USA. When I asked Will for his definition of spiritual intelligence, he told me of a gospel story in the New Testament of a man who was possessed by demons. Jesus drove the demons from him and thus healed him. And then Jesus cast the demons in the abyss. And here is the phrase that means everything to me, continued Will. It says that if it says that the man was found clothed and in his right mind. 
Okay, I said, frankly, not understanding what Will had meant. Will must have read my mind because he quickly explained, I see that as having his dignity restored. As physical creatures, to be clothed means to have your dignity and your social identity and your health and cleanliness restored. Ah, I said, we understand how fashion can be destructive, but on the other side, it infuses self-respect. He explained, particularly for poor people, clothes are very important for their dignity. I recollected seeing children in Jamaica and India coming out of small huts, perfectly turned out and flawlessly ironed sparkling white clothes, proudly carrying their lunch, boxers, their lunch boxes. I chuckled and shared that image with Will saying, seeing those kids was always amazing to me. I wondered how their mothers ever pulled it off. I could never have done it. To be clothed as an image of, dentis, of dignity, but also of individualized, individualized agent, continued Will. To make his point, he described his grandmother, a working class woman, very house proud, who kept her house clean like an immaculate palace. He showed me a photograph of her as a young woman in the 1920s. She was a wonderfully dressed flapper. The photograph made me think of my own preference in clothing. Decades ago, showy clothes appealed to me, and those days I used to dress to look attractive. As I found myself, the accent shifted to comfort and to blend in with the surroundings I no longer sought to impress. The funny thing is, when I became comfortable with myself, I found people got attracted to me, even if for different reasons. Will gave me another example of an elderly man who had lost his wife and seemed to have come apart. One day I saw him in town. He looked smart. I knew he was a grieving widower, but his clothes suggested he was proud and that he had inner resources to keep living. I thought how brave he was. I nodded. That made sense. In the biblical narrative of the man being found clothed and in his right mind, clothes were a metaphor for inner strength, for self-esteem. I have come to believe that happiness comes from feeling comfortable within yourself. And that can only happen when you understand who you are and where you fit in. Only when you are comfortable with yourself, will you think of giving to the people in your life and to your community. The world may, too much, the world may be too much to say. What about in his right mind, I asked. How do you interpret that? To be in your right mind does not mean to be bright and brainy. It means to be emotionally and spiritually well, not terrorized, but with a healthy sense of reality, a sense of your own autonomy, as well as interdependence with others or what we call humility. Spiritual intelligence for me would be percent of a way of life that allows people to be in that biblical image, clothed and in their right mind. I think the important thing to understand is that spirituality is not a thing in itself, but a dimension of human life. We can't live healthy, wholesome lives without it. Wow, Will's simple statements seem to take in much of the wisdom I came across while researching this book. How can you stay, how can you stay calm despite the madness in the world around you? How do you look at a murder in the eye without hate? How can you take responsibility for your life how can you do your bit for the environment? Whether you are of a spiritual bent or not, if you seek to live meaningful, meaningful, meaningfully in these times, new answers to these questions. What's in a name? It is wisdom we can all use. So that's one of the chapters in the book. Yes, last one minute of meditation, along with the wisdom of Betty Steinhar. Last one minute with closed eyes. We are doing in the presence of Betty Steinhar, absorbing the essence of her wisdom. Last one minute with closed eyes, clasp the fingers, observing the breath with smiley face. As you are observing the breath, the Christ consciousness is surrounding us making us more holy, more healthy. The smiles are increasing with each breath observation. Normal, natural, easy, soft,
tranquil breath observation. Last 30 seconds. As you're observing the breath, the smiles are increasing on the face, spreading all over the body, all over the face. Every cell is smiling. You are spreading these soulful smiles into the area of pain, into your surrounding area. Yes, your body is becoming very, very light, very, very energetic. And final five seconds, the smiles are increasing, spreading all over the body into your surroundings, into the whole space, you are spreading this soulful smiles, soulful intelligence, spiritual intelligence, making you rich of gratitude, compassion, self-love, final five seconds. We are very glad to be in the presence of Betty, Steinher, who traveled extensively, interviewed wonderful people, written a wonderful book, Spiritual Intelligence. What a wonderful, magnanimous personality. Last five seconds, whole body becoming vibrant, energetic, healthy, surrounded by wonderful aura, of magnetic influence, attracting the wealth, health, unity, oneness. You can feel the Christ, Jesus, with us, filling every cell with holism, harmony, hell. What a wonderful state. Meditation is not prayer. Meditation is not contemplation. It is simple observation of the breath. Be with the breath to experience more life, to share more life with everyone, animal, plant, mineral, avian, angelic kingdoms. Yes, with cheerful face, slowly, slowly, keep palms over your eyes, Express gratitude to all your parents, the creation by the God, and thank everyone for having this wonderful life. And slowly, slowly, open your eyes with cheerful face. Yes, wonderful. Every cell is glowing. The smiles you are spreading. Wherever you are, peace, joy, power, wonder, magnanimity prevails. Wherever you are. You are connected with the universe. Every being. The spiritual intelligence is spreading everywhere, making everyone awakened, enlightened, empowered in all dimensions of the life. My dear masters, my dear gods, my dear friends. We are all here to uplift the consciousness of the earth. Yes, wonderful. Veena, slowly, slowly open your eyes. From the blissful doctor's arc, we thank Betty, strain her. Such a wonderful experience and such a wonderful wisdom you have given to us today. And we request you to 
uh, even share your wisdom with all our doctors so that they will also understand what life is how extensively we can connect to the humanness everywhere we invite you to our blissful doctor sir platform a channel tv channel where you can share your wisdom wonderful. about spiritual intelligence too that would be wonderful thank you because i think the doctors i the experience i've had with the medical profession in india has been superb and i would honestly say that i think that your doctors are way ahead of the western doctors in terms of understanding that spiritual emotional intelligence is, is all part of the healing process yes, so we are connected I with would be, i would be delighted yes we are from pssm pyramid spiritual societies movement led by brahmashi pitamaha patrishi and i am the founder of blissful doctors arc not ah. masses but also the medical doctors we want to empower very spiritually okay yes. no so, i think it's very very important yeah so for past 25 years dr hari ji is uh, constantly empowering people through meditation and various workshops of on healing and other modalities he is also a keynote speaker to various organization globally so yeah uh, thank you so much for your time meti ji it was a wonderful uh, yeah, thank you insights. thank you very much and i'm sorry for all the sound complications and the fly that was buzzing around okay, thank you so, so much it, yes it was wonderful uh, going through betty's insights and if you go through the book there is a lot of information very practical there are no techniques as such but you take lot of uh, simple points from her own life from her own interviews yeah. and this will be a transformational to each and every one of the viewers over here so please uh, go through her book the details are uh, provided below this video and the website everything is uh, already provided so you can reach out to betty g whenever you feel like thank you so much thank you